Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Mary Laporte, president of the League of Women Voters, Missoula, and I welcome you all to this program on understanding local government. I'd like to begin our meeting with our League of Women Voters, Missoula land acknowledgement. The League of Women Voters of Missoula acknowledges that we are gather on the traditional lands of the Salish, Kootenai, Kalispell, Pendere, Blackfeet, and Shoshone tribes. The voting rights of these native peoples were not secured until the 1960s, 40 years after the 19th Amendment secured the right to vote for some women. The League is committed to protecting equal access, to voting and resisting efforts to disenfranchise. This program is about uh, preparation for uh, an item that will be on the ballot in June 2024 primary elections, where all voters in Missoula and Missoula County will have the opportunity to vote on whether the city of Missoula or Missoula County should review its current form of government. The question mandated every 10 years by our 1972 Montana Constitution gives voters the option to decide if they would like to consider or undertake a review of local government. We are inviting citizens to learn more about their current form of government this evening. We're pleased to welcome Josh Schlotnick, Missoula County Commissioner, who will present an overview of uh, Missoula County government, and Jeff Badnock, who is our League of Women Voters board representative, who has been leading our study on local government tonight. I'd like to thank everyone who helped uh, putting this uh, meeting together. Uh, Nancy Maxson, Barb Holmes, Nancy Lifers, <laughs> Sally Brown, and um, all those here tonight, and Nisha Woolman for our outreach. So uh, there are a couple things. One, uh, if you have on your table, we have a pop quiz with some basic questions about local government. I invite you all to fill this out sooner rather than later. And uh, we will have the answers. Nancy Maxson put this together for us. And we even have prizes. So our idea is for you to have a little fun tonight. So that being said, I'm going to invite uh, Josh to uh, present an overview of the Missoula County government and uh, he's planned to talk for about 15 minutes and we will have time right after Josh speaks for questions related to Missoula County government. Thank you and thank you Josh. Okay, thanks. Do you need, do you need the, do you need the mic for, for your recording? Okay. Well, thanks a ton for having me. And I'm excited to chat with you a bit about county government. I was looking at the pop quiz. There's only a few county questions. It's mostly city questions on there. And I think this is reflective of county government in that we are the under the radar government. I've been to plenty of city council meetings. I went to one last night for a few minutes. And there's always a big crowd. And people come to city government to talk about every single, every possible issue in their life is brought to city government. That doesn't happen with county government. Most people don't know who we are and their meetings are only attended by people who are actually really affected by those agenda items. When we say, is there any public comment on items not on the agenda? There's mostly never anybody there. When they say that at a city council meeting, there's a line. So there's one difference between the city and the county. Everybody knows the city government, county government is pretty under the radar. And it's an important thing to note, the city is in the county. The city's the county seat. What really makes the city and the county different are the services that each government provides. So whether you live in the city or not, you, prov you receive a set of services from the county. If you live outside of city limits, you receive services from the county as well in a way that's a little different than if you lived inside the city limits. So I'll just review a few of them. No matter where you live, we only have one jail. And it's run by the county. No matter where you live, we only have one elections department. It's run by the county. Our offices, Office of Emergency Management is also run by the county. 
Our health department is a city county health department, but everybody there actually works for the county. But the city contributes 40% of the money and the county, or city contributes 60% of the money and county contributes 40% of the money. So Sally, who lives near the university, you're actually a resident of the county, and when you pay taxes, you pay some county taxes as well, and those cover things like elections, Office of Emergency Management, animal control, things that the county provides the city, city residents. You pay the city for public safety and for roads in a way that I don't. I live outside of city limits. I pay all those first things I mentioned, but I also pay, city, uh, pay county public works and the sheriff instead of you paying for city public works and MPD. Does that make much sense? Just nod. <laughs> Ask away. I was just going to make a smart remark. Oh. <laughs> it feels like from my last tax bill that yes. I'm paying everybody every Yeah. Man, I would love nothing more than to talk property taxes. So when we're done, I'm happy to do that. I, yeah. We'll just put a, put a pin in that. And no, and I would love to. But maybe before I go, let's talk for a few minutes on property taxes. Because given that bills went out, it's on everyone's mind. And I really want to make sure that people understand what, how your taxes were arrived at. Where did that number come from? And which governments are responsible for which piece of the equation that ends up yielding your total tax liability? So other things to say about county government. We are what's called a general powers form of government. That means legislatively, where we can make ordinances, we can pass ordinances, things that look like little miniature versions of law, we can only do what the state legislature has said we can do, and nothing else. So some people have reached out to us and said, you guys should make, make it so that there's no plastic bags allowed in Missoula County. No one-time use plastic bags. Not a bad idea. Really good idea and all, for all kinds of reasons. Well, in the list of things the legislature said we can do, it's not on that list. Our legislative space is really small. It's basically parking resolutions. Now, that sounds like, wow, what an ineffectual county government. You guys got nothing going on. I would say quite the contrary. We are highly effectual, and where what we can do is work with our staff and our budget to actually do projects and make things happen. We are much more like a big nonprofit than we are a governmental body. Not, it, we're different than a nonprofit in that we collect taxes and we provide services according to statute, but we're a lot more like a nonprofit in that we have projects. So homelessness is a really big deal. We have a whole bunch of projects around dealing with homelessness that have nothing to do with making law. Our, our Executive space is big. Our legislative space is really small. So in terms of our executive space, we don't have a singular executive like the city does. There are a bunch of different forms of city government. Our city government form has, our city government has the strong mayor form of government. We don't have that. We have three commissioners. Basically, that means we have a three-headed mayor, which can be really difficult. And for people like some of you who have been around government for a while, I'm sure, Jeff, you can remember times when there were three county commissioners and they didn't all get along. And that is a terrible situation because they are literally a three-headed executive of a big organization. I mean, right now we have more than 1,100, well, more than 1,000 employees and a 200 plus million dollar budget. Those three people can't get along it, and they, and they have to singularly make decisions about how to spend money and who's going to do what. Executive decisions, like a CEO type decision, not a legislative body decision. God, three heads, that's gonna be really difficult. And from what I've heard from staff, there was a time when key county staff, a chief administrative officer, the person who's at the top of the pyramid, spent most of her time doing shuttle diplomacy between three commissioners who did not get along. Right now, that's a function that does not have to be met. We get along. And we get along really well with our staff. We have a really positive work environment. Just as a place where human beings go for 40 hours a week, it feels really good over there. There's lots of respect. 
and humor, and it's just a really good place to work. And I think this makes decision making much easier. It's not that we agree on everything, but in terms of values, we're fully aligned in the same direction. And we wouldn't even say argue, but we would debate about strategy on how to get from point A to point B, but the fact that we need to get to point B is never in contention. So other pieces on county government that I think are really interesting, and these are again in contrast to city government, we have a ton of elected officials in county government. Rather than say the number, I'm just gonna say who they all are because I would have to count them up. I should probably know, but I forget. So we have three commissioners. We have a county auditor. Anybody wanna guess what this person does? Numbers, yeah, this person makes sure that Nobody's getting a contract to do some paving because they're somebody's sister-in-law. And make sure, basically they're to stop fraud with public money. That's what they do. So why would such a person need to be elected? Why not just, you know, hire a good accountant? Is it the legislature? No, no, no. Yes, exactly, exactly. You want to explicate a little, expand that? Well, the citizens want to know that they have somebody they've elected who's keeping an eye on. Yeah, that's part, that's, that's definitely part of it. But I guess where I'm going at is in terms of fraud prevention. If the person who was the auditor worked for me and Dave and Juan, we could sit her down and say, you know, we really need to make sure this paving contract goes to the Johnson brothers, just so you know, and you do work for us, and we will be renewing your contract next year. But, you know, please enjoy making this decision. But we can't do that. The county auditor does not work for us. The, our county auditor's name is Dave Wall, and he is a man of massive integrity, and he's a very smart fellow, and he's also very values-driven. We have an excellent auditor. Dave does not work for us. He works for all of you. We can't tell Dave Wall what to do or what not to do. He is his own elected official. And I think in terms of fraud prevention, it's a really good idea. So other electeds, not only do we have a county auditor and three commissioners, we have a clerk and recorder and treasurer. Those are multiple positions held by one person. In some places, those are split up. In some places, there even more positions are combined in one. But we have Tyler Gannant, who's the clerk, recorder, treasurer, which means he's the person who sends out your tax bills. He also runs the shop where you go to deal with vehicle titling and with all records related to real estate. In that same building over there in the courthouse, we have the county attorney. The county attorney runs the prosecutorial side of the justice system for Missoula County, and the civil folks work for her. So if somebody is suing the county, it's her shop, Kirsten Pabst is her name, that fights on our behalf, unless it's some specialty kind of legal niche where we don't have someone who could do it. But if it's a criminal thing, it's absolutely in, in her world. And she is not accountable to us, she's accountable to you all. In the justice system, we have two justices of the peace. So in the court system, there's municipal court, which is at the city, there's justice court, which is at the county, and there's district court, which is also the county, but it's really the state. So if you're in district, so I'll, I'll break those down. Municipal court, it's in the city, and basically if you did something in the city that's a little bit bad, but not very bad, you go to municipal court. If you did something at the city that's kind of bad, you're going to justice court where the justices of the, of the peace are. If you did something really bad, you're going to district court. District court folks, interestingly enough, work for the state, like their paychecks are paid by the state, but they are elected by the county. How the commissioners interact with all those is that we, the commissioners, are responsible for the budget. And what that really means, especially this time of year with these tax bills going out, we are responsible for asking the county as an entirety for a big chunk of money. And that chunk of money helps run county government. I'm only saying helps run because about one third of the money we use to run county government comes from local property taxes. The other two thirds come from grants and fees for service, grants that we get from the state or the feds or philanthropists. We only use a third of the money we spend only a third of the money we spend comes from taxation. So you may have seen charts and graphs that our governor and his buddies have put in local publications, all across, publications all across the state saying, oh my God, look at Missoula County spending. They are drunken sailors on a binge and need to be stopped. Two thirds of our spending does not come from taxes. 
And we compete really well for grants because we have a super strong grants department. We got a $13 million grant for doing sewer, water, and road grid out by the airport. So our spending went way up last year. None of that came from taxes. We had more than, I think, more than $10 million come in in ARPA and CARES money during COVID that we used to deal with the effects of COVID. That was not tax money. But if you look at how much we spent, it looks terrible. I'm digressing a little, but I just want to let you know. So with all those other elected officials that I mentioned, they are their own people. They do not work for us. We cannot tell them what to do, but we can tell them yes or no on their budget, and that makes everybody a little edgy. I wouldn't say grumpy. We just have to work together. It's hardest with the judges because no one tells a judge what to do, and the judge's preeminent concern is public safety, and it is not in their minds to think about other things. So if they say, we need three bailiffs in here all the time. And we say, geez, that's about 100 grand a bailiff. That's a lot, given all the things we're facing. They say, I do not care. I need a bailiff in my courtroom. Do you understand? Because <laughs> that's how they talk. <laughs> so we did elected officials, uh, what the commissioners do, manage the budget, and ask for taxes, we are really the three-headed CEO of a big nonprofit. Other little tidbits of info on county government, we have 32 departments. There's a lot going on there. Our biggest department is lands and communities. This is where we're dealing with planning and zoning and subdivision. We're doing long-term planning and short-term planning. Also in this department is our grants program and parks, trails, and open lands and our interactions with open space. Also under that department is extension and the weed district, which if you haven't visited, they have a beautiful new building out at the fairgrounds. I think our smallest department is called Central Stores. These are two people who basically deal with buying stuff and distributing it. I'm talking about like office supplies and office furniture. Most all of what county government does is pretty boring. I don't think it's boring because I really like solving problems and I like working with other people, but the stuff that gets all the attention at the legislature, should there be drag shows in Haver? We don't do that. It's curbs and gutters, sidewalks, emergency management. It's just nuts and bolts of providing services. One of the big questions that you all may consider when you talk about doing a local government study commission is the very first thing I led with, the general powers form of government. Should we be a general powers form of government where we can only do legislatively what the state says we can do? Or could we be like the city where it's just the opposite? The city can do legislatively anything they want as long as it's not prohibited by the state. So the city has a really broad legislative space we have a very narrow, leg leg narrow legislative space, but I feel like we actually have a bigger executive space. I'll leave it at that. Uh, we can ask questions, go to Jeff, whatever, whatever you'd like. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the services on our tax bill, uh, that if you live in the city, you don't pay. Yes. Can you enumerate some of those? I think you mentioned like roads. So if you live in the city, you don't pay county public works. You pay city public works. So you're still paying for roads, you're just not paying for county roads. If you live in the city, you pay a good chunk of money that goes to the Missoula Police Department. You pay a very small chunk of money that goes to the Sheriff's Department because we operate the jail and the Sheriff oversees the jail. But you're not paying for on the ground public safety at the county, you're paying that through the city. So those are two, two differences. But no matter where you live, you're paying for the Elections Department. Is that? If you live in the city, you can actually, no matter where you live, you can go to Missoula County Property Tax Information System dot com or dot org, type in your address, type in taxes, and click on pie charts. And you can see a pie chart of how much money you spent in property taxes and where it went. And if you live in the city, I'm going to guess 25% of your property taxes went to the county for the services I just mentioned. Probably 32% went, maybe 30, 32% went to the city. Another 30% went to 
the school district, and the remainder it went to the state and then to some other small little things. If you live in the county and you went to the same spot and clicked on property taxes and clicked on pie charts, you'd be paying probably close to 35, 40% to the county, 35, 40% to the school district, and the remainder to the state and to a bunch of other little entities. So that's different. And typically, if you live in the county, your overall property taxes are less. So sources of revenue for you as a town commissioner are only property taxes and mm -hmm. then the other stuff that you bring in from all of your entrepreneurial grants. Yeah, so well, two thirds of the money we use does not come from property taxes. So the vast majority does not come from property taxes. Most of the money we use comes from grants we compete for from the state or the feds or from philanthropic entities or fee for service. At the county, we have the biggest clinic in the city is actually part of county government, Partnership Health Center. PHC has, is the biggest clinic in the city, also the biggest pharmacy. It's about $42 million a year to run, and it runs entirely on fee-for-service. No taxpayer money goes to PHC. Mostly runs on Medicaid, but there is some private insurance as well. But it's mostly Medicaid dollars. So those dollars show up on the revenue side of our budget, and none of them come from taxes. And I'm really proud that we get to be affiliated with PHC. They do incredible work, and they serve the needs of people who need it most. PHC is what's called an FQ, a federally qualified healthcare center, which means they can bill at 100% of Medicaid, which is quite unusual. If a person has Medicaid and they want to go to Western Montana Clinic, Western Montana Clinic will say, yeah, we're happy to help you, but you know, Medicaid's only covering 65% of your visit, so do you got the other 35 in your pocket? Because we can't really take a loss, and I don't blame them. They can't take a loss. They have bills to pay, too. FQs can take 100%. So if you have Medicaid, you go over to All Nations Health Centers, also an FQ, and PHC, it's all covered. It's really a great, it's a, it's a great thing, and they do a super good job. They're all, they also have a residency program. So they have a, like 30-some-odd young people who are training to be doctors who are training right here. So when you go over there, it has a very alive, vibrant feel of a, of a learning institution with young people involved that some of our other healthcare places don't. Well, you mentioned that a lot of this money does come from grants. How does Missoula yeah. compare to other cities in the state? Well, Jeff can talk about cities, but in terms of a county. And people always do it. They forget we even, it's the under the radar government. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. It, uh, part of the confusion might be right there. Uh, we do better than most everybody. We're at the top of the heap. We have a fantastic staff. We live in a place full of people who are really well educated and competent and actually love where they live. So we compete really well. What are you most proud of about Missoula County and what you do? Man. Okay, so can I do a few just in the recent past? So in response to homelessness, I am super proud of our temporary space, temporary safe outdoor space, also known as the T-Sauce. And I wouldn't blame anybody if they said, I don't know what you're talking about which is proof of how successful it is. Does anybody not know what it looks like outside the POV? Or hear about the controversy around Johnson Street? There's no controversy around TSOS. We have 30, I think 32 little shelters. These are 100 square foot. They look like a child's drawing of a house, like a, a square with a triangle on top. They're heated, cooled in the summertime, obviously have electricity with a bank, with a bunk, bunk that drops down, and a little desk. And these are situated in a little community, a little neighborhood near the corner of Mullen and Broadway. We partner with Hope Rescue Mission and the United Way to make this happen. We intentionally have kept it really small, and it's pretty rule governed. And we have services on site. Near, a little bit more than a third of the people who have lived at the TSOS are now in permanent housing. And that's not because we got them a voucher and got them into the tightest rental market in the world, right here in Missoula. It's that the services on site help them get better. And like most all of you and me in this room, if our own personal lives fell apart, our loved ones would catch us. Well, if we had trashed those relationships, there'd be no one to catch us. That's what happened with most people who are living outdoors. 
And at the TSOS, we provide services so people can put those relationships back together. And now they're not in temporary housing, they're staying on their brother's couch or their friend's basement or something like that. Uh, it's really successful. If you go visit, it's clean, well-managed, just looks like a bunch of little buildings. Nobody even notices it's there. Uh, I'm really proud of that. In terms of taxes, that's a big, big thing. I'm really proud that we were able to keep our ask of the county, the whole county, to 5.4%. Now you'd be like, wait a minute, my taxes went way up more than that. That's the long discussion we gotta have. But in terms of how much money did we ask of every property in the county, we asked for 5.4%, less than the rate of inflation. We were able to be super thrifty. I'm proud that we answered uh, the need for housing by, by building infrastructure, not with tax dollars. Sewer, water, and road grid in the Bill Grant area, and housing can follow. How are you of this library? Oh my gosh, can you believe this library? A wooden, uh, international award-winning library? It's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing. And is a point of contention out in the hinterland in the county. Because I'm sure you can imagine, we go to the Swan Valley Community Council and people are mad as hell and they say, God damn it, I pay for that library. I ain't never even going to go there. I hate it. This isn't right. I'm subsidizing that thing. And what we found when really digging into property taxes, and this has been hard for people to hear in the hinterland, they have roads that are well maintained because people who live in target range pay for them. If we took all of the money that goes into the road fund from the Condon area in the Swan Valley, it's about $80,000. That pays for one road operator and no gear. I imagine a person standing there in a high-vis vest and nothing else. No shovel, nothing. Instead, they have access to five operators and five sets of gear for plowing and maintaining gravel roads all summer. How is that possible on 80 grand? It's that money from the rest of the county goes to subsidize that. And so my response to, like, I pay for the library and I'll give her go there is like, and I pay for maintaining Cold Creek Road and I'm never going to drive on it. And this is actually not a, not a problem with the system. It's how the system's designed. We actually have enough money to maintain a basically well-run society because we share all our resources and send them where they need to be most of the time. We can all identify holes in this system and people who are left out and problems, but generally it works pretty well. And it works pretty well because of a social compact. We've agreed to pool our resources to solve problems. Okay, Missoula is the only incorporated- Yes, very good point, very good point. Are any of the other communities Considering like Lolo or? Yeah. Okay, it's a great question. So in order to be incorporated, you have to have at least 300 people, but you have to have 200 people per square mile. So the density is tough. So like Frenchtown was like, we hate you guys so much, we're bailing. They were like, divorce. And we're like, fine, <laughs> you, can, you can go. Uh, but they didn't meet the density requirement. Sealy would meet it, Lolo would meet it. Only having one incorporated city really means, as a county, I would say we are the biggest county in the state in terms of how many people our county government provides services to. Billings has got, Billings is bigger in terms of population, but they have multiple incorporated places. Gallon County is about the same size, but they have Belgrade as well as Bozeman, and there's probably, there may be other ones too. Manhattan is too, good job. So not having incorporated cities means we actually have to serve a lot of people. I would, if I could snap my fingers, I would love to see Sealy Lake be incorporated. I'd also love to see them have the same resort community tax that Red Lodge and West Yellowstone and Whitefish have. And I feel like they could use that money to fund the cost of having a city government. If they just incorporated without it, they would spend more money to provide services than they are right now. But they are a resort community. They get tons of tourists. They could use that provision in state government to create a tax to extract money from tourists. They could use that money to build their sewer and save their lake. But that's a different chat. Do they need density? 
Yes. Would that be required to go through the local government review to make that happen? No, no. Uh, they just, they would have, they need at least, they need to meet those levels at 300 people, 200 people per square mile, and uh, it would go on the ballot. And, and they'd have to draw a boundary. I think the Department of Commerce has, has something to do with that. And then there'd be a vote. And it's not up to the commissioners. It would be up to, up to those folks. All right, there we go. So I would love to hear what you have to say, but I'm gonna run and meet my family before six. Should we give Josh a door prize? I think oh, I'll take your door prize. Yeah, I definitely think. Because I'm sure you passed the pot quiz. <laughs> I didn't even take <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. It's a pop quiz. Oh, there we go. <laughs> See you guys next time. Thank you. Josh is a tough guy to follow. I'm sure I won't be nearly as entertaining talking about the city. Um, one of the things that I want to take exception with, because um, as much as I admire and like Josh, he's wrong when he said that we have a strong mayor form of government. We don't. We used to, but we don't. We have a charter form of government. And this is a distinction that's made in state law. And this charter came about as a result of the last successful um, local government review of the city. Um, this charter was written and presented to the voters, and they accepted it. In fairness, I have to say that the charter uh, wrote down almost exactly the form of government we had when we had a strong mayor form of government. We kept the mayor, we kept the same number of wards, we kept the same number of people representing the wards at two. That's included in the charter. But we most certainly have a charter form of government, we most certainly have self-government powers as described by our uh, state statutes and in the Constitution. Um, this was presented in April of 1996 when it was voted on at the primary election that year, and then it went into effect January 1 of 1997. Um, when the state thinks about government, the thing that it values the most in the statute is the legislative aspect of local government. Every form of local government that is permitted in state statute focuses on there shall be a legislative body that enacts um, local ordinances and resolutions. They also, in some cases, provide for an executive, a mayor. And the different forms are um, the strong mayor, the commission form, which is just an elected legislative body. It's kind of what the county has, what Josh described. A city commission would act just like our county commission does. They would enact the laws, they would administer the laws and execute uh, the laws on behalf of the people. There is a form of government that the state law provides, which is called commission presiding officer which is what they do in Bozeman, is very similar in Bozeman, they elect five members of the city commission and during the vote for city commissioners, the person who gets the most votes in that election gets to be mayor. Um, and the mayor in Bozeman is kind of what they call primus inter pares in Latin, first among equals doesn't have any greater authority than any of the other commissions, but the mayor runs the meetings and signs the documents. In small towns, really small towns, under 2,000, they have a town meeting form of government They open to them. In other words, everybody who's a registered voter, an elector, can come to the meeting, and there is usually one person elected to preside over that meeting, 
and then everybody gets to weigh in on everything and everybody gets to vote on everything. It's probably the purest form of democracy available in terms of local government in the state of Montana. Um, but you have to have a population of 2,000 or less to do that form of government. Now, one of the things that Josh said when he described the limitations of county government, they can only do what the legislature lets them do. The legislature doesn't let them do a lot of things. Uh, Self-government, charter form of government, on the other hand, is allowed to do whatever they want unless the state tells them they can't. So on the one hand, for the counties, they do what they're told they can do. And in the charter form of government, you can do anything unless the state tells you you can't do it. Now that was a pretty wide open field of action for governments like Missoula and all the other cities that have charter forms of government. And when I say that, all the class A cities have charter forms of government. Missoula was the last one to get charter form of government. Billings, Bozeman, Helena, Butte Silverbow has a charter. Darby in the Bitterroot Valley has a charter. There are lots of communities that have charters in Montana. In my estimation, we haven't really seen local governments be allowed to act in that arena to their full capacity. I was looking today and uh, in the Montana Code's annotated, and there is a section in the local government general provisions which are powers denied. This is the list of what the state says we can't do. And among them are um, any power that applies to or affects any private or civil relationship. That is, we can't make laws about partnerships, about marriages, about things like that. Uh, another one is any power that applies to or affects the public school system. Well, clearly. We have school boards for that. We have a state um, superintendent of education. We have a board of regions. We have a, Mon a Missoula County superintendent of schools. But local governments, we had nothing to say about education. Any power that prohibits the grant or denial of a certificate of compliance or a certificate of public convenience we can't say anything about taxi services. You might remember a few years ago, they wanted to have an extra taxi service in Missoula to compete with Yellow Cab. And they tried to advance it, and the state said, no, that's the province of the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission has to say whether Missoula gets a second taxi cab company. Um, any power that establishes a rate or price otherwise determined by a state agency. We can't set prices for things in Missoula. Any power that applies to or affects any determination of the Department of Environmental Quality with respect to mining, a mining plan, permit, or contract. Where that comes into play is when people want to open up gravel pits. And you want to stop a gravel pit from being opened up next door to you? You can't go to the city for it. The county might have something to say with the environmental health issues, but it's going to go to the State Department of Environmental. It's not going to be something that the city can deal with. Any power that defines as an offense conduct made criminal by state statute. We can't make up our own crimes here. If it's not a state statute with respect to crime, even though we have our own charter, we can't make up laws that result in people being able to be charged with crimes if they break them. Um, oh, here's one that you're not going to be surprised at. Any power that applies to or affects the right to keep or bear arms. If the city of Missoula wanted to have some sort of gun control legislation, smart locks, keeping guns out of the hands of domestic violence, any of that stuff. No, can't do it. 
Even if you have a charter form of government, you can't do that. Any power that applies to or affects the standards of professional occupational competence. If you're a profession, if you are a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, um, a dentist, a uh, chiropractor, we can't cover any of that stuff. And here's one that I thought was kind of interesting, and I think it was uh, added uh, fairly recently. Any power that applies to or affects landlords. We can't tell landlords what to do. Um, we cannot do anything that is intended to license landlords or to regulate their activities with respect with, with, with regard to tenants beyond what is provided for in title. We can't argue with them. Yeah. Did any of these provisions say when they were enacted in the law? Um, this this uh, revised thing, this happened uh, two years ago in 2021. Yeah, yeah. Some of this stuff was in before, but they've added to it. Um, we can not have any power, we have no power to enact ordinances prohibiting or penalizing vagrancy. That's kind of a fair one, I think. Um, the list goes on and on. One of the ones that's specifically in here has to do with auxiliary packaging. Missoula, you might recall, a few years ago tried to pass a ban on single-use plastic bags because we've got plastic bags in the landfill and plastic everywhere. And when the city of Missoula said, well, let's talk about banning those, the legislature said, no, you shall not. You shall not ban plastic bags. That's an auxiliary form of packaging. You can't do anything. You couldn't put in a two cent tax on bottles and cans to promote recycling. You can't do that. Missoula, even if you want to, you cannot. So this is kind of a way that even though the state and the Constitution on one hand giveth, the state on the other hand taketh away. So we don't get to do that. So with our form of government, um, and we just had a, uh, an election for mayor and city commissioners, the way it's set up is that every two years, there is an election for a uh, member of the city council. The ward terms are staggered so that every two years, the people in the ward get to vote either to retain somebody or to elect somebody new if, there's, if there's, that's their preference. And the mayoral terms are four years. So every four years, we have a mayoral election. However, with this recent situation, Mayor Engen was elected, passed away. We got an acting mayor, Gwen Jones. Then we got a permanent acting mayor, Jordan Hess. And then we've got Andrea Davis, who was just elected to finish out the rest of Mayor Angen's term. And in two years, in 2025, we're going to have another mayor election. So it's possible that Andrea could decide not to run again, or she could be beaten, and we would end up having five mayors in four years. That's very, 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 very rare. Um, but that's the way it's set up in our charter. That's how we decided how we would do these things. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the charter. Um, the charter, for all intents and purposes, is something that is invisible. No one ever talks about it. They don't talk about it at the city council. They don't, the mayor never talks about it. No one ever runs to it to see what the charter says. It's pretty simple stuff. It's pretty simple. I would like to see the charter talked about more often. And the reason why is that the charter can be amended. It's in here. We don't have to wait 10 years to amend this charter. The amendment procedure is included in the charter. But if people don't talk about the charter, they don't realize that it can be amended, it's not a tool for making our government better when we need it to be better. 
I would like to see, for example, in all the ordinances that are passed, in the whereases, you know, at the beginning it says, whereas this, whereas that, whereas that, now, therefore, we, the Missoula City Council, do ordain this to happen. I would like to see in one of the whereases, pursuant to the authority granted to the City Council by the charter of the City of Missoula, we are now going to therefore do this. I would like to see the charter mentioned. I would like to see Missoula have a charter day where on the anniversary of this adoption, they would have a, a, a day in school where they would read part of the charter. Or kids would do coloring projects on the charter. Or they would debate whether we should have a charter and do that in schools. We should have a charter day in Missoula. So we talk about this. It's not very inspiring in the sense that it's not as long as the Constitution, but it, like the Constitution, it has a preamble. And I would like to read the preamble because I think the preamble is probably one of the best things about this charter. And it says this, we the citizens, not the people, the citizens of the city of Missoula, blessed by the natural beauty of our mountains, valleys, and rivers, enriched by the diversity and vitality of our people, mindful of the contributions made by those who lived here before us, and thankful for a good place to live and for the rights and responsibilities of liberty, as stewards of our community, do hereby establish and ordain this charter to provide accessible and effective government for ourselves and our children. That's not a bad aspirational document, if you ask me. But you never hear anybody say that. You never hear anybody. We know the preamble of the United States Constitution. We, some of us know the preamble to the state constitution. We don't know the preamble for our city government and how aspirational it is. I think this is something that people should read. We should read this almost as often as we read the land acknowledgement. This is important. This is the aspirations of who we are and how we want to govern ourselves. And this document should live up to those aspirations. Um, is there anything wrong with our current form of government? Is there anything wrong? It's not for me to say. It's not for me to say, it's for the people to say, and it's for us to help them understand that they do get to say. They don't know that they get to say. I am still astonished at the number of people who do not know that this local government vote is coming up and that they have a chance to weigh in on how our city governs itself. And for the audience, when the league did our candidates forum. That was a question that was asked of all the candidates. What do you think about it? Well, the candidates all were nodding their heads. Seems like a pretty good idea. That just means that we need to talk about it more because we're not seeing resistance, we're seeing ignorance. And that's what we have to fight against. It's not resistance to, just to review our city form of government, it's ignorance. So with that, is there any questions? Yes. What is uh, the process to be able to amend the charter? The charter can be amended. Um, let me read it exactly. An amendment to this charter may be made only by submitting the question of amendment to the electors of the city. To be effective, the proposed amendment must receive an affirmative vote by a majority of the electors voting on the question. An amendment approved by the electors becomes effective on the first day of the city fiscal year following the fiscal year of approval unless the question submitted to the electors provides otherwise. And then it goes on to say, an amendment to this charter may be proposed by initiative by petition of 15% of the electors registered at the last general election or by ordinance enacted by the city council. The question on amendment of the charter, of this charter, must be submitted to the electors at the next regular or primary city or county election 
in the manner prescribed by state law. So the people can do it, the council can do it. Nancy. Say 15%, 1-5? Yes, 1-5%, 15%. So about 13,800 people. Yes? Uh, but the local government review could decide to look at the charter? Yes, and, and if there is local government review, that's probably the first thing that they will do is they will examine how we do things now. And they could examine this charter and in the course of their study and review, come up with recommendations. I mean, they may want to create additional elected positions. They may want to change terms. They may want to change the number of wards. They may want to change the number of representatives. Yeah, they can change it. And that this is probably the first thing that they would look at. The list of restrictions that the state has on the city is that regardless of what kind of, what form of city government we have? Like, are those restrictions on every city in? No, these are the restrictions on, on communities that have charters. Right. So that wouldn't apply to a smaller city that does not? Right. A city that doesn't have a charter, the state statute says what they must do. It, it outlines what elected positions they must have. It talks about their budgeting and all those kinds of things. But again, they do what they're told to do. We do whatever we want, except what we're told not to do. It's kind of a weird mirror thing. Mary. Is that the same as this general powers of form of government? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the county, the county has general. And again, this goes to the, the bias in the statutes and in the Constitution to have a legislative body. Three commissioners get elected, and they have the legislative power for the county, but they also have this other power of administering an executive function. The city and the county probably right now work together better than any time I can remember. I can remember the time when they had the shuttle diplomacy. I can remember when you could identify the county commissioners by which one, which one or ones weren't the jerk that week, because there were some that sometimes they were jerks. I can remember when they used to fight with the city. Um, the planning office, ever, it seems like without fail, every 10 years, something bubbles up about you know, we really should put the city and the county planning together. And then 10 years later, we really should split them apart. And I remember one time when they split up the planning office, they decided that the employees would go on the county personnel system. And they had a fight over who got the vehicles, because there's a lot of cars and trucks and stuff that planning guys. And it was... Um, when it was all said and done, there were some complaints that some of the vehicles they got were real beaters, and they weren't, they weren't happy about that. They felt they got taken, but, yep. So uh, what occurred to me when you were reading the Thou Shalt Not um, is something that would come up where two people in the LGBTQ community wanted to get married. And if we cannot decide, is in the city make law against that? Could, does that mean somebody could get married? Because there isn't a law about it, unless, of course, the state made a decision about that. So that would be, can you? Well, I think the intent, of the, the intent of the law is that in the state of Montana, if you are going to be married, in, it's, it's like in the, it's in the state versus the nation. If, um, if a, a gay couple can get married in Missoula, we can't make that law and then force Mineral County to recognize that marriage, you see. So what they want it to be is that if you want to be a gay couple and get married, it has to be able to be something that the entire state recognizes. 
that, that's pretty specific. What I was trying to get get at were places where things were opened by omission. Oh. Yeah, it, and I think that's the intent of it. If they haven't told us we can't do it, that means we can, if we want. Yeah, yeah, right. But the, one of the specific, specific things in here has to do with um, establishing ordinances governing relationships. And it says can't do that, no. Mm -mm. So we have to, but the state does that yeah. for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Jeff, this, I think I know the answer, but let me just check. So, so the statute at the state level says our governments cannot do any gun regulation. But then on the other side, for a general powers, they don't have the power to do it either, right? No, they don't. No. So, but they have to have separate legislation. There's two different sets of laws that clarify that. Yeah, this, this list was to keep charter governments from going off and doing whatever their people wanted them to do. You know, if you imagine you, if you lived in Ravalli County and Missoula set up some sort of gun regulation and you were going to hunt up in Lake County and you had to drive through Missoula County with your guns and you'd fall under our laws, be kind of a problem. But what I'm saying is, is that there's a body of law in the rules that says what a charter cannot do. And there's a separate body of law that clarifies what a general powers government can do. Right. And what's in the general powers doesn't allow them to do it either. Right. But, but the authority that prevents all of that or allows all that is two separate places. Right. But it's the state doing Yeah. But it comes from the state. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting question from a political science point of view about how much leeway do you want a local government to have? You know, we wanted to have a resort tax here in, in Missoula. And this legislature specifically said, no, Missoula, you can't. And you said, well, we want it just for ourselves inside our county. And they said, no, you can't. Now, if the county had had a charter and a self form of government, could the county have done it? Well, no, because this would have covered this would have governed them too. But how much power do we want our our governments to have? And that's the kind of the the deeper question of local government review: is how much power and authority and responsibility do we want our local government to have to operate on our behalf? On one hand, there's an argument that says, well, local government, this is the one that's closest to the people. We know Josh. We know Dre Davis. We know our county, our, our city commissioners. We know these people. How many state legislators do we know? Our government, our county, Josh shows up to work 40 hours a week. The mayor's office, they show up 40 hours a week. The council, even though it's a half-time job, they spend all Wednesday in committee meetings. They have constituent work. They have all kinds of stuff that they do on a daily basis. The legislature meets for 90 days every two years to pass laws. Yeah, they have interim committees. Yeah, they do other work throughout that intervening period. But these people up at the county courthouse and in the new Angan local government center they come to work every day for us. Wouldn't you think they should have a little bit more authority and leeway to do things for us? And that's the question that local government review is going to solve. So can counties have a type of charter system? Yes, counties can have, they can have a charter. And if you look, for example, at Butte, Silver Bow, and Deer Lodge, Anaconda, when they joined their city and county government, they did it through a charter mechanism. They have a charter to do that. But there's one charter for the yes. city yep. and yep. county. Yep, yep, yep. So that both governments were completely conjoined? Yep. Okay. Yep. And again, the only way a city and a county, I mean, if we wanted to put <clears throat> the city of Missoula together with Missoula County, the only way that that can happen is 
if the county residents vote to have a study commission and the city residents vote to have a study commission and the two study commissions meet and agree that that's the way to go and that's the recommendation that they would then put before the voters and the voters of both the county and the city would have to agree to it. So it's a pretty high bar, but that's the path to how it could happen, but it's a pretty high bar. Okay. Yes. Um, so these lists of the things that you can not do, um, do those change? Uh, is that the legislature? Like, will that ever change? Could you repeat? Yeah, the, the question is, this list of the things that local government, charter forms of government cannot do, can that be changed? Yes, this is an act by the um, state legislature, signed by the governor, and at the next legislative session, they could go in and add to it or delete from it or modify it. But this, is, this comes from our uh, state legislature. About through the courts. Well, that's a whole different question. Um, if the city or the county objected to any of these provisions, they could go to court, but since the state passes the laws, unless it was a violation of the Constitution, I don't know that a local government would have any standing in court to call this stuff into question. I don't think they would. It's a political question at that point. Okay, anything more? Your local government is the one that's closest to you. It's yours. Put your fingerprints on it. Talk about it. Raise questions. Read the charter. Read the charter. Talk about the charter. Let people know we have a charter. Copies of the charter are here and available through the League of Women Voters. It's also online at the City of Missoula's website. You can find it, read it. Learn about it, find out what's good about it, find out what's not good enough about it. And if you have ideas for changing it, it's yours, so make a suggestion. Do you want to talk about the glossary and that yeah. we've got an MCAT and it's on our website? Yeah, there is a glossary that is probably, thank you, Nancy, probably the most helpful tool that we can put in the hands of people other than the charter itself. It's a local government review glossary of the terms that are, that are about local government review and about local government. Um, this is something that every citizen should get their hands on and have available as in the next six months, this discussion on whether we should have local government review takes place. This is invaluable. This is really good stuff. And it's on the League of Women Voters website. Um, so go Google it, find it, and read it, use it. Anything else? Did you want to close it? Well, we oh. Our pop quiz. oh, yeah, it's time for the pop quiz. We're going to do this. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I'm Nancy Maxson with the League of Women Voters, and one of the key missions of the League is always voter, voter information. And this year we're really focusing on local government review and getting the citizens of Missoula aware um, of the fact that local government review is coming up. And as, as uh, uh, Jeff mentioned, we have a glossary uh, with all sorts of terms in it, and you can check if you want copies or of any of the information that we have here, I recommend you uh, contact us through our email, which is Missoula LWV, all one word, at gmail.com. Again, Missoula LWV gmail at gmail.com. Uh, we also came up with some census figures, just sort of to compare how big the city of Missoula is versus the county, and compare it to a couple of other towns and the state of Montana. And we have some quick facts on the bottom about the county and the city government. We also came up with a pop quiz because we thought uh, our audience members might have some fun answering questions about local government. Now, how, how do you want me to do this, Mary? Do you want me to just read the whole quiz <laughs> or? 
Uh, I, I don't think that we need to read the whole quiz, but should we? Do you want to pick a few and we could have some discussion about it? Um. Make it pop. <laughs> well, I think one of the interesting questions about on here is how many mayors have we had uh, since 1990? Um, because this was brought up earlier. Jeff mentioned this, that we could have five mayors in under four years. Um, and uh, the number of mayors we have had since 1990, I have to find the question now, um, is five excluding the one who was just elected. Uh, uh, Dan Chemist served from 1990 to 1996. Uh, Mike Cadis served from 1996 to 2006. Of course, John Angan served from 2006 to 2022. Then we had Gwen Jones step in for a month, and then Jordan Hess, and now we've elected another one. Um, anyway, we have copies of this available if you'd like to contact us. And otherwise, I think I'll just turn it over to you, Mary. And we'll go ahead and... I'd like to, um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you all for coming tonight. And special thanks again uh, to Josh Slotnick, our county commissioner, and Jeff Badnock, our board member, and... Um, all these resources are available, as Nancy said, and please use them. So thank you for coming tonight.